Right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Many of you out there know me, and it's really good to see some faces from the past, if I, I may term you as such. Oh, that's roaring. That's roaring. Uh, good to see you all again. For those of you who don't know me, there was a claim this morning, I think Paco said that he'd been to every, he'd spoken at every security uh, that there's ever been. Now the catch is that I only ever turn up when somebody else has dropped out. I am first call emergency reserve speaker, and once again, they've done it to me this year and said, Ian, someone's dropped out, would you give a talk? Uh, and so in fine tradition, I have absolutely nothing to say to you. So all I'm going to do is talk about some stuff that I've been playing with. Uh, I'm not going to reach any tremendous conclusions on this. And you can all have a laugh and see what I do when I'm not standing in front of classes and, and see what it does. Um, unusually for me, because you know I'm the digital forensics guy around here, uh, I will be treading upon the borders of what is acceptable, legal, decent, moral behaviour. Okay? Um, so, in fact, they shouldn't really have introduced me as Dr Ian Ferguson at all. Today, in the fine tradition of the Ethical Hacking Society, for the first time ever, I'm actually going to use a hacker handle. Okay? And that handle is Jedgar. And if anybody can work out why, then A, you've got a bit of historic knowledge, and I'm looking at Mark here. Uh, and B. Oh, fairly obvious. <laughs> As the case may be. Right. Okay, uh, enough. What I'd really like to talk to you about today are probe requests as a threat to privacy. So follow my chain of reasoning. If by the end of this talk you think that they're probably not a very good idea, then we'll do something about it. How does one do something about an internet standard? How do, 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 we'll have to worry about that. Can, can we persuade people not to use them anymore? Right. So, let's do this the way that uh, you guys are meant to do your undergraduate <coughs> presentations. We'll talk about the motivation and the background for this. First thing I want to point out, really, this, please, this is a work in progress. This isn't finished stuff. This is something that I've been playing around with in my spare time for a while and just thought you might find it interesting what I've been up to. Um, we might talk a little bit about war driving, which kind of 10 years ago was a really sexy topic and now everybody knows what the hell war driving is and nobody does it anymore. Um, we might say a little bit about how it's actually the basis of the Android and the Apple location service and why that's an interesting thing. We'll talk about what a probe request uh, actually is, how we can send one, how we get one back and what the hell they're about. Um, and then we'll extend that, I think, to the idea of can we track people, can we profile people through the use of these probe requests and whatever they may be. But before we go there, there is one word which spreads fear into the heart and minds of staff and students alike at Abate in the Ethical Hacking Society. And that word is quite simply, Mikey. Uh, where, is, where is he hiding? Where are you, Mikey? Is he gone? He's, he's wisely run away. Because I'm going to blame him for all of this. He, he's the one who kind of said, Ian, would you come and give a, a quick talk? Um, the catch is, he didn't bother telling me when the slot was, so he did actually have me schedule his first after keynote this morning. So I had to actually send him a very, very rude email saying, don't, uh, but not in quite those terms. Um, and secondly, he didn't bother telling me it wasn't a 20-minute talk. Now, apparent, uh, apparently, I've got you for an hour, which, you know, as a lecturer, is exactly where I like you. Okay, so, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see where it goes. So... First of all, just to kind of illustrate what the hell is a probe request and why is it of any interest to us uh, whatsoever, I'm going to run a little Perl script called uh, hoover.pl. J. Edgar Hoover. Okay. Yes, it's like humour, but without the funniness. Um, and this was by two guys, Nielsen and Mertens, a few years ago. I take no credit for the, the bit you're uh, about to see. Um, and what this is, in fact, is a, just a very simple Perl wrapper around the T-Shark program, the command line version of Wireshark. So let's 
just run this particular program. In fact, I've been running it for a while in the background. Let's just see what it's been doing. Well, excuse me, I'm going to have to bend down here. My eyesight isn't good enough to actually see the damn thing. <laughs> You're, you're not going to believe me when I tell you I didn't do that. <laughs> but that, that couldn't have been set up better. That really couldn't. That is superb. Um, right. What I'm going to do, this program has been quietly running for the past hour or so, uh, gathering information. And I do apologise if it's your phone that has leaked this information. But, well... <laughs> Frankly, that'll teach you, sort of style. Uh, right. Okay. So what does it do? What does it do? This program simply sits there listening for these probe request packets. And this is what it's collected over the last hour or so while sitting uh, amongst this... Oh, good Lord, there's hundreds of them. Oh, we've, oh it's a good one. We've got a good, we've got a good batch today. Look at this. That's a superb collection. It's far too large. I can't talk about it. Uh, okay. So, let me just... Before I talk about what that is and what it means, let me just quickly nip back to the slides and we'll discuss what a, what a probe rec packet is and why we might be, be interested in it. Um, I'm sure some of you know this. Right. If you're carrying around in your pocket... A mobile device. Imagine it's the first time you've used it, you've never turned it on before, brand new shiny iPhone, turn it on, go out into Dundee, oh I'm in Starbucks, I'll have a coffee, while I'm there I'll use the free, unsecured, Wi-Fi in Starbucks. What does your phone do with that information? It says, oh well, I've seen all of these base stations, these base station IDs, BSSID, one of them Starbucks free Wi-Fi. Tell you what, I'll remember that. That might be useful. So it caches the base station ID. Next time you walk through the streets of Dundee, it's actually sending something out as you walk saying, hey, Starbucks, you there? Starbucks. Are you there? Uh, and if it finds it, of course, it promptly connects to it. So as you're walking around, as you log into whatever Wi-Fi you log into, it remembers the base station ID and caches them. So very typically around here, if you log on to the EduRoam Wi-Fi network, it remembers EduRoam and shouts out, Hey, EduRoam, are you there? Uh, we had a good one a, a few years ago when we first tried this, that uh, up came a base station ID called Madame Fifi's, which we thought was interesting. It's probably a poodle grooming parlour or something like that, but it just sounded interesting. But forevermore, the person who had been there, their phone was shouting out, Hey, Madame Fifi's, are you there? So in other words... Your phone is keeping a record to some extent of where you've been. It's not the geographic location, but it's keeping a list of all of these places that you've logged on to. And forevermore, as you walk around the world, it is shouting out, Hey, Starbucks, are you there? So consequently, if I run this little program that I was running earlier on, I can see, I suppose I really ought to obfuscate all of these if I was being uh, particularly ethical. We can see all of these packets, these probe request packets that are going out. Each one of these is a shout saying, Hey, Balasis25, are you there? Hey, welcome to Lush, are you there? Hey, Thirsty Tomato997, are you there? And of course, if they are, it connects, but it's just shouting this out all the time. But when it shouts it out, obviously it's sending this probe rec packet. Any packet you send has to have a source address. So here it is. Here is the source MAC address. It's the MAC address of your phone. So actually what I could do, uh, and have done in the past, is actually sort these 
Is it worth trying to do that now? Probably not. I'll let you use your imagination for this. I could sort these by MAC address, and we're going to see here's a group of five that came from this MAC address. So I know that that particular device has been shouting out saying, can I speak to that particular thing? Well, of course, some of these are geographically interesting. What do we got? Well, Topshop, okay. There are lots of Topshops, but yeah. Um, who uses the Wi-Fi in Topshop? Don't know. Uh, Thompson Home, uh, what do you can usually find? I mean, almost guaranteed around here, and it'll have picked it up from my phone. There'll be, a, you know, Scott Rail free Wi-Fi. Yeah, okay, he's been on Scott Rail. Um, let's just have a, a little trawl down here, so we can see anything interesting. Uh, somebody's private BT Hub one, always interesting. Tesco free Wi-Fi, free tram Wi-Fi. So I'm pretty sure that whoever owns the mobile phone with that MAC address hangs around in Edinburgh some of the time, because we're fairly sure that's where that one comes from. Uh, I could Google it. Uh, Private Sky one. Double Tree by Hilton. Okay, that's a hotel just outside Dundee. So we know somebody goes past there, somebody works there, somebody's been there. Uh, Clyde Hotel. Yeah, okay. I'm a bit suspicious about gaping anus, mind you. That was that was that was slightly worrying. Um, pineapple. All right, okay. Interesting, in, interesting stuff going on here. Yes. Uh, I, I love Putin. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Uh, you've obviously seen what you've, you've you've obviously seen one that kind of second from bottom. I'm I, okay. I'm innocent. I don't know. Somebody somebody can explain that one to me later. I've no idea. Uh, okay. Oh, oh. Some somebody's got their own private name in there, but that's not necessarily. Okay, so you get the idea that, you know, sim s s s oh dear, oh, oh dear, <laughs> please. That's the, that's the same one that has Aberdeen City and mysheep.com, I suspect, but never mind. Um, okay, you, you, you get the idea. You're, le you're leaking a whole truckload, I believe, in Russia, malformed packets. Central Hotel, Waterstones. That could be me. I've just been to Waterstones. Uh, actually, that's, that's a really good collection. That's one of the best I've ever had when doing this demo. I think that one might get... Um... Yeah, okay. Ed, 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 Edudram, the Scottish version of Edurum. Yeah, it, 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 it could... I'm going to have to resist very hard the temptation to investigate that one a little bit further, but uh, never, never, as it were. Um, right, okay, so we can see that, yeah, the, the stuff being leaked, we could attribute certain base station IDs to say, well, that, that, that mobile device has definitely been attached to that at some point in the past. If we knew where these were, then we could start saying something about, well, I know this person has been to a certain place. Okay, so... We'll, we'll take that much on board, and we'll go back to the slides, if I can see them. Right, so let's, let's, just, let's just backtrack a bit to where we started with all of that. So that's, that's quite simply this Perl program going around there, and it'll sit there running for as long as I care to leave it. It'll collect these things and uh, then dump them out in the format that we just saw. Very nice, okay. Um, if I've got any claim to fame, I suspect I may have been the first person to get that particular Perl thing working on MacOS, but yay, big deal, who cares. Uh, if anybody does want to try and play around th with this on Mac, then actually you can't use some of the normal Hoover stuff that kind of comes with it when you, when you kind of read all the document documentation, the readme. Um, it kind of says, yeah, you set it up like this, actually on a Mac you don't, it's completely different. And you'll need a thing called airport to actually set the interface mode into, um, into promiscuous mode to work. If anybody really wants to try it, uh, you don't even need hoover.pl. Simply typing that into the command line of any computer which has got Wireshark on it, in that case a Linux computer, uh, will have pretty much the same effect as what you've just seen. So actually gathering these packets is pretty easy. And actually the, the, the worrying thing to me is We'll come on to this later. A, it's probably an unnecessary protocol. Do you really need to do that? Why do we do it? Well, just so we can speed up the connection time. Um, and B, it, you know, this is on by default. So, 
We'll go through the consequence of that in a minute. I talked about war driving earlier on. I just want to make sure that you all do know what the, the whole war driving thing was about. Um, so this is actually a, a map of Seattle from around about 2004. Uh, now, I was actually working in the area of location-based systems at the time, so I kind of knew quite a, quite a bit about this once upon a time. The idea is very simply that you take your laptop, you sit in the car, you get your mate to drive you round, and as you go, you listen for base station IDs being broadcast. Now, we've got to watch carefully here, because there's two separate things going on. With war driving, you drive round, you're listening for the base station. Okay, That's the base station sending out, saying, Hi, I'm Starbucks. Do you want to connect to me? The stuff we've just seen, caping anus, etc., is different. That's not the base station broadcasting. That's the phone saying, Hi, are you there? So there's a difference between the base station saying, Hi, I'm here, and the phone saying, Are you there? Okay, so there's two separate things going on here. And with war driving, the idea was very simply that you drove around, you had a GPS device connected to your laptop at the time. Well, they're all built into the phones now. I, I, I'm sure you can do this with something on a, or currently on a mobile phone. I haven't tried it for years. Uh, you drive around and automatically, every time it detects a new base station, you read your location from the GPS and say, right, if I'm in that position there, no, sorry, I've just heard that base station there. It's called Starbucks free Wi-Fi. Uh, the GPS tells me I'm here. Therefore, Starbucks is here. Okay? Repeat for all of the nice gritty patterns in Seattle, and you get a map of the base stations. I think that's actually quite interesting. Yes, that's quite dense there. Yes, that is Seattle. I would love to see that map now. As I say, that's 2004. I suspect you're not even going to see the streets for the, for the icons on it. I think it'd be a very interesting thing to do. Some of you may even have tried this in Dundee a long time ago. I remember some of the undergraduates around here going off on a war driving expedition when Colin told them to have a try at it. Tony's nodding. Yeah, OK. Um, I know somebody was actually planning to do this with uh, one of the quadcopters, one of the drones. So you get war flying. I don't know whether anybody's ever had a, had a go at that. Again, obviously, because you're up above, the, you, know, you can cover the ground much, much easier and you get good reception. And it's quite an interesting thing. It is potentially interesting to point out at this stage that actually both Android and MacOS use this as the basis of their location system. So if you got your phone and you've turned the GPS stuff off, because using the GPS on your phone drains the battery like a good one, as we all know, you still can find out roughly where you are. Well, how is it doing that? Well, actually, it's using this. Um, Apple and Google maintain their own database of this kind of stuff. Okay? And actually, I have good reason to suspect that when you're wandering around with your phone with the GPS on, even if you're not running an app for it, even if you haven't done anything about it, I think it is quietly collecting as you go all of this information and shipping it back to the mothership. Certainly some years ago, that was definitely the case. Whether it's still the case, I don't know. But they'll, they'll have to keep this database up to date. Obviously, the ba new base stations arrive, old ones disappear. And if you want currency, they'll have to be doing something like that. So the whole war driving thing is actually, you know, what was once a nice student gimmick, is actually the basis of location on everybody's mobile device these days. And it's kind of what it falls back to if the GPS is turned off. Interestingly, it also does exactly the same algorithm uh, with the, the cell tower IDs. So you know that each uh, cell of the cellular wireless network has its own ID. It's doing pretty much the same kind of thing with those. And again, once upon a time, that was done from a map provided by the cell phone operators. And they kind of said, well, we've got a base station at the top of Dundee Law. Its geographical coordinates are that. Uh, dear Mr. Apple, dear Mr. Google, you may use that information to say you are in cell such and such when you're in that place. Again, I suspect they actually probably use, well, exactly the same algorithm, if not exactly the same software, to do the same thing these days. So, okay, war driving. Right, so we've seen that. We've seen the difference between war driving and the kind of stuff, this, 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 this caching business and this probe re request thing that, um, that I'm talking about. So we've demoed that particular program. 
let's have a, a quick look at the the technology. So here are the two kinds of frame. The first one is the probe request. The second one, and that is one, is the probe response. Um, so basically, what have we got? Frame control, some stuff here, the MAC headers, the destination address, the source address, and the base station ID. So these packets get sent out with the source address of your mobile phone and the base station ID, Starbucks. Hey, Starbucks, are you there? I'm phone such and such, and I'd like to connect to you. So as you go, you're spilling this stuff all over the place. Uh, this is the returning packet, and this is actually just the kind of standard broadcast thing that the base stations uh, are doing anyway. So they're setting their, their source address, their base station ID, saying, hey, I'm a base station, I'm here, do you want to connect with me? If anybody's interested in that. Right. So, what can we do with this? What is actually being done with this kind of stuff already? Well, uh, we can capture the phone Mac and the base station ID. We've just seen that. That's what hoover.pl was doing. Um, some systems have been known to actually use this to recognize the phone Mac address and go, hi, I see you've just walked into Starbucks. We now know who you are because we recognize your phone's Mac address. Uh, you usually buy a skinny latte and a wasn't great muffin. Would you like another one? Um, you get the idea. Now, interestingly, there was a, a thing, I think it was last year I was looking at this, and I suddenly realized that actually Apple had got wise to this and realized they were giving away people's information by doing this. So by sending these, these probe wrecks out, they're effectively leaking where you've been to the general public. And what they started doing was deliberately spoofing the MAC address in the probe rec packets. So you would get a phone wandering past one day going, hey, Starbucks, are you there? I'm such and such. Same phone next day, wander past my scanner thing, and it goes, hey, Starbucks, I'm somebody else today. Uh, so they thought they were increasing their security by actually doing that, as opposed to some extent they are. What I want to show today, and this is kind of why I got interested in this stuff, is actually I don't think that works. I think you are leaking sufficient information that I can identify who you are, even if they are spoofing the MAC address. Okay, we can work this location history out, a rough location history admittedly, but a location history nonetheless. Uh, what else could we do? If we pushed this technique as far as absolutely possible, what would we be able to deduce about people? And that's what this project is really all about. Um, just another kind of <coughs> aside here. Usually, I think, and I haven't verified this, <coughs> phones are really only sending these things out if they're trying to log on to something. If they're, if they're currently attached to a base station, then they don't need to be sending out probe requests. Yeah, I'm already talking to somebody. Why do I need another one? Poor signal? Want to swap to somebody else? Possibly. Um, so what we could do if we wanted to suddenly acquire more of these packets, we could start doing some kind of deauthenticate attack. I could send a, a spoofed deauth packet uh, out saying, hey, Mr. Mobile Phone, I'm a base station. I'm not really, but we'll pretend. Um, please deauthorize yourself and do it again. At which point the phone drops the connection and goes, okay, Starbucks, are you there? Edurome, are you there? Madam Fifi's. Oh, yeah. Okay, got you. Uh, so I could force more of that if I wanted. Um, those of you who've ever played around with a pineapple will know that, that is exactly what that's doing. It's deliberately trying to force you to drop the connection. It then spoofs the connection. Your phone reattaches to it. And, of course, instead of talking to the real base station, you're talking to the pineapple, and it can sit there and man in the middle of you quite happily. So that's a bit of kind of BSS ID impersonation, if you like. That's what pineapple's all about. So that's a, an active kind of thing. If I was being aggressive, I could do that. As it happens, I've never implemented it, but that's pure laziness on my part. If anybody wants a, uh, something to do over the summer and wants to help me implement the all thing, then that could be fun. Uh, the little system that I'm going to show you in a minute that I'm playing around with down here is called Henry J., uh, and the reason for that will become apparent 
soon. It's very much not active, it's passive, working on the basis that if I'm not sending anything out, then you don't even know I'm doing this. So the nice thing about some of these attacks, if we can call them an attack, is that you know, I literally send nothing out, so nobody's going to know I'm doing it. Uh, all I'm doing is passively listening with some of this stuff, which I thought was quite good fun. So, like any good uh, project student, what I really ought to have to, to guide all of this is a research question. What am I actually trying to do with this stuff? And I kind of set myself a task, something along the lines of that. How much can you find out about somebody just from having had them walk past me, my computer, while I'm sitting there uh, recording, monitoring, sniffing all of this stuff? And it occurred to me that if I started doing things like geolocating where I'd seen a particular phone walk past me, and time stamping that observation, and if you made lots and lots of observations, then actually you might be able to start telling some very interesting things about people. Even with one computer sitting on a desk, I can pretty reliably say, well, that person walks past me at 10 past 9 every morning. Oh, actually, that must be Dave King, because I see him go past. Okay, so you know, I can identify somebody's phone fairly easily for that. What exactly could you do if this was scaled up enormously? Now, at the minute, this is sitting running on my Mac and not doing very much else. Uh, we'll see a little bit about what I've done in a, in a minute, about how we could actually scale this up to something that requires, you know, something from the Amazon cloud that we were talking about this morning. Think big data. What, what are the, what's, the, what's the actual ultimate logical conclusion if you expanded this as much as you can. And that's pretty much what this is all about. Okay, so some use cases. One, yeah, okay, my Mac sits on my desk and I can record this kind of thing as people go past. Incidentally, if anybody can tell me whether it's illegal for me to sniff these packets, I don't think it is because you're freely broadcasting them. So I can't see there's anything particularly wrong with that. Uh, I couldn't honestly think of any legislation which... There is. Ofcom has some legislation which essentially says that any communication that is not intended for you, you're not allowed to intercept it, which is ridiculous because mm. that would mean that uh, unborn babies in the womb are violating mm. the Communications Act. But it is intended for me. I might be Starbucks. I might be offering a service. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Let's, let's, let's. <laughs> We're all friends here. Let's not argue. Uh, okay. Uh, so one monitoring device, one place. Yeah, you've seen that. We've got that. Um, I thought this might be quite fun. War posting. <laughs> what would happen if I took my laptop, charged it up, set it running, stuck it in an envelope, slung it in the post box, addressed to my mate in London, and down it goes on the truck, on the train, whatever, collecting these bloody things all the way to London. And he takes it out, hopefully charges the laptop back up, puts it back in the envelope and sends it back to Dundee. Well, okay, that's, that's not going to work. That's not realistic. But I bet you I can build a device that could do that. I'm not going to send my laptop, but I bet you can build something I can. So war posting requires a partner at the other end to kind of, you know, I, I want big coverage. I don't want to sit at my desk and do this. I want to cover the whole damn country. I'm going to snoop on the whole damn nation, okay? Um, also, do I really want my laptop back in three bits? Uh, probably not good. All right. How about war duct tape it to a truck? Ing. So instead of instead of putting it in an envelope, if I had a disposable laptop, if I was rich, if I was Colin McLean, you know, uh, he'll kill me. Um, I could set my laptop going. I could sneak out into the street, duct take it to the bottom of a truck while nobody's watching, truck drives off and covers the world for me. Well, that's great, but the data's just gone off on the laptop and the truck. Okay, how about if I write a little program that every 10 minutes it stops doing this and looks for a free open Wi-Fi somewhere near and actually phones home back to my server and says, Here's the stuff that I've just gathered in the past 10 minutes. Yeah, that would work. It's going to get expensive. You know, laptop, laptops ain't cheap. Phone. Mobile app. Mobile app. 
Yeah, could do that. Uh, let's go, let's go, I, I, we can't have an academic presentation without a bit of Latin in it. For goodness sake. <laughs> Extensio ad abs, ad abs, I can't even say it. <laughs> Extensio ad absurdum. There you are, I've been practicing that. Um, what if I could have loads and loads of these, these scanning things, these monitors sitting around the place? Where would I put them? I'll go and put them in bus stations, in railway stations. Why? Because there's lots of people there, and there's lots of people trying to connect to Wi-Fi there, so there should be some good data. I'll put them in service stations. If I really wanted to monitor the entirety of the UK by myself, could I do it? Well... If you've got money, you know, finding, find, finding the server space ain't too bad. Thank you, uh, Mr. Amazon. Could probably build a server big enough to do it. Sending the phones and the laptops out is probably a bit of a problem. They're getting rather expensive. But this isn't. Right, if you're in the first year, and I see we've got some of the first years in here, you've played with the Wemos IoT device. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, have, have seen these things. These are gorgeous little things. If you're not into Wemos technology, if you take one thing away from today, go and buy yourself a Wemos and just see how amazingly clever. See how much clever you can buy for three dollars. Okay? So what is it? It's that. It's a computer. Really? Yes, really. Uh, processor. Don't ask me how fast it runs. Not very fast. Uh, got RAM on board. <coughs> 96k of RAM, so not vast, but a damn sight better than some of the Arduino things that I was playing around with him a couple of years ago. Uh, but what is this? What is this? It is a wireless antenna. And for $3, you can buy yourself a fully Wi-Fi capable computer. And I find that stunning. I, I, I really do. I think that's impressive. Um, it's also got four megabytes of flash on board. You program the damn things in C with the Arduino development environment, fire the code at it, and it sits there and it runs. It's meant for playing around with electronics, so it's got spare pins on there to which we can connect anything we damn well like. What I've done is connect a GPS to it and connect a real-time clock module, battery-backed to keep the, the clock running as it goes. Uh, I don't usually blow my own trumpet. I'm not one for showing off, but this I really like. The 4 megabyte flash has a file system on it. It has a flash file system on it, so you can write files to it. I built a persistent hash map on top of it. Now you're going, eh, that's not exciting. The older folks around here. Now, who am I looking at? Are there any older folks here? I'm trying hard, desperately hard not to look at Rory. Sorry, Rory. We'll remember that kind of in your second year at university, one of the thing, one of the classic things that they used to get you to do was to do the data structures and algorithms class. Please, can you write a linked list or a hash map or whatever? I don't think I've written a hash map from scratch since I was an undergraduate. And then I actually needed to store stuff on here. Ah, right. Spiff's file system, database, persistent hash map. I, I spent two glorious days, when, actually when I was going down on the train to do my external examining gigs last year, hacking away in C. I, I tell you, I have never been happier in my life. Uh, just built... Just bi yeah. Yes, I'm actually using something from my undergraduate degree for real. Hallelujah. Uh, no, really, 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 really good fun. Uh, so yeah, I, I built that. If anybody wants to do this kind of thing, I'm more than happy to give the the database stuff away. I really ought to put it on GitHub. Maybe I will. So there, yeah, I'm, I'm not paid by Wemos, nor am I paid by AliExpress, where they are available for three quid. You can get them from Amazon, eBay. Take your, your favorite supplier. But do yourselves a favor. Get into this. This is really good. Okay, so he's talking about duct taping laptops to the bottom of lorries, and suddenly he's shown us, actually, we can do this for three quid, for three dollars, plus the price of the battery. Hmm, right. So, my methodology, what I've been trying to do, is to create the, this mobile monitor that we could do war posting with if we're feeling that we want it back, or war duct taping 
if we're feeling that we can actually afford three dollars and just send one of these things off. Uh, I built a version of the software to do this, to actually collect all of the data in Java, and of course it got called Electrolux, because nothing sucks like an Electrolux, uh, Electrolux J, because it's in Java. Well, that ran on a laptop. I wanted something small, and the only kind of Hoover domestic cleaning appliance related thing I could think of, which was smaller, was Henry. The little red things that the cleaners use around here. So the version I've got is called Henry J. Okay? Uh, and as soon as we're into this, well, Hoover, we'd better have Jedger as the, as the moniker. So that, that's the mystery behind that salt. Um, what is Henry J? Henry is an ultra lightweight mobile probe request monitor suitable for duct taping to the bottom of cars, trains, buses, and people. Um, I refer to the previous name of that base station we spotted earlier. Um, you don't need duct tape. Uh, <laughs> so, sorry, sorry. That was, that, was, that was possibly a step too far. Uh, thank you, pardon. Um, hey, that would save even more money. It's cheaper. We don't need the duct tape. Right. Uh, right. The problem with this, of course, is that that thing we've just said only holds four megabytes. Now, actually, in terms of the observations that I want to take, what do I want to store? I want to store a couple of MAC addresses, a source and a destination. What are they? Six bytes each? So 12 bytes. Uh, I want to store the base station ID, 32 bytes at maximum. Uh, I want to store a timestamp to say when it was, four bytes for a Unix timestamp. I want to store a location. Uh, take your pick, another eight or so bytes. Call, call it another 16 bytes. So actually, it's not that many bytes per record. Um, and you can, get, you, know, you can get some quite respectable amounts of data into four megabytes of flash when done like that. Um, but of course, actually what I need to do is to be able to ship that back off to the mothership somewhere. So what I've done is create a scalable repository which actually collects these things. Now, at the minute, I think I've only got two of these base stations actually in existence at work, uh, but the, the repository is there. It would sit and conceptually listen for uh, as many as we like. Now, again, that's been implemented by uh, a piece of technology which I found really stunningly good. And if you haven't had a chance to use Neo 4J, again, please do yourself a favor and, and find out what that's all about. It's a graph database, and you know, people look at me strangely when I say, I really like databases. Now, one of the best kept secrets in this room, Natalie, are you here? Shut your ears for the next 10 seconds, okay? Um, I have a dark secret past that I actually know SQL, okay? Uh, I know about relational databases. I always keep silent about this because I really, really, really don't want to teach them, okay? <laughs> Okay, nope, your ears again, thank you. Um, Neo4j isn't an SQL database. I suppose it comes under the heading of no SQL database. It's a, gra it's a graph database, but it's really, really nice stuff. And for reasons that you'll see in a minute, it's really appropriate for the kind of thing that we're, we're trying to do here. So the question is, can I connect these little Henry J's to the, uh, these monitors to the repository? Well, answer, yes, I can. Uh, Neo4j exposes a RESTful interface, and it's almost trivial to fire stuff from Henry over an HTTP connection back to uh, the repository. So actually, we do have a store these things locally for 10 minutes, half an hour, or until you're full, or till you see the next free Wi-Fi that you can leap onto and phone home, but we've got the capability for, for catching that stuff and firing it all back. Okay, so here's Henry J doing his stuff, but that would be cheating. What we need to do is the live demo. Ooh, there we are. Uh, that's Henry J down here. He's hiding on the dock cam just down here. This is the Wemos device here with the Wi-Fi antenna. This is the GPS module. That's the GPS antennae. 
and I have to say what I think is absolutely the cutest thing in the world. And I bet, you know, there's, there's my thumb for comparison of size. The world's smallest computer monitor, 128 pixels by 64. And if I shift the wire out the way, you will see that May the 18th, 1441, I think it's probably running on Greenwich Mean Time rather than British Summer Time. Uh, no GPS. It can't get the GPS in here. It really struggles inside. Actually, most of the time, I'm just using the GPS to set the clock. And once the clock's set, that doesn't really matter. It's nice if I can get location information. And here we are, just to prove that it is actually listening. So O2 Wi-Fi, crazy eyeballs, Edu Roman, Wi-Fi Extra. I've no idea, but those are the last four probe rec packets that it's seen radiating from your phones at the moment. That'll work. That'll sit there quite happily. It's collecting these things. As I say, it's got a, got a capacity of several hundred thousand of these things. Uh, the next time I take that home, it'll kind of get home and go, in 10 minutes, it'll stop connecting them. Audrey's router, Andrew's router. I love Putin. Okay, demo, hi. Yeah, by, you know, by all means, you try and send those BSSID packets. See if you can get your name and lights on there. There's a challenge for you. Um, when I take that home tonight, it will... <laughs> well, well, you didn't let me down. Well done, whoever it was. Thank you. Um, okay, some... Uh, yeah, I think you've just given it away, mind. You're doing that with a pineapple, somebody out there, I guess. Is anybody going to ad admit to this? That would be asking too much. Don't worry. Moo. Uh, okay. Uh, please keep the gaping anus away. Okay. Um, let's keep it clean. Take that home. That will hop onto my Wi-Fi at home. It will recognize that the server uh, is there. It'll dump all of that. So I can just carry that around in my pocket, and that will quietly collect things. I could take that, and as you can see, it's not particularly large. Again, you know, for comparison, a finger. Uh, <laughs> stick a... <laughs> I've got to leave that there for amusement for the next 10 minutes. You've got time to try all more if you want to have a go. Um, for what it's worth, it's actually running from a, just a, a fairly standard battery pack at the minute. It's not connected to a laptop or anything. It is... <laughs> go! It is purely, uh, purely self-contained. Um, we could, if we want, try some of this war driving, carry on with that. I believe in Russia Direct. Okay. Right, regrettably, we must go back to the, uh, the slides for a moment. Okay, so that's Henry J. What does it actually... What does it actually do at the end of that? What can you do with the data? Yeah, okay, we've proved we can gather the data. Can we actually do anything interesting with the data? Um, here, that's the, the static version in case my demo goes horribly wrong. If you'll allow me to sit for a moment, we shall just see if we can get the live version of this going. Uh, okay, so a graph database okay, is essentially nodes and links between the nodes. So the green ones are base stations, the blue ones are mobile devices that have been attached to those base stations. So big surprise, and I do apologize, I don't think I actually can make this any larger. I can, but I've got to go hacking in JavaScript, and it actually usually breaks it. So I'm, I'm not going to try that today. Uh, Edu Rome in the middle, maybe you can see that with a whole bunch of people's devices around there. Well, again, no surprise, we're in a university, we get loads of those. Um, you will notice there that I ran a query, and having said that it's not SQL, and indeed it isn't, but it does come with its own query language up there, and that's just telling me telling it to return the first 100 observations that the, the thing has made. So we can see that, yes, there's a, there's a cluster over here, uh, and there's some ones around it, so the cloud. And again, these are just MAC addresses in here. Really ought to obfuscate those. Apologies, but I don't suppose anybody goes around remembering their MAC addresses. That would be so sad and hackery. Thank you, Rory. Uh, okay, very nice. Um, so that's, that's the first 100, but that's, that's not... This, we want big data. Uh, let's actually tell it to return the whole damn thing. Here's one I ran earlier. 
So what do we got? We've got Eduroam again and a whole bunch of things surrounding it. One person here who uses Eduroam obviously goes off to a whole bunch of other places. Hotel, Sky, Sky, VM, uh, DW, DW Fitness Free. What's that going to be? Is that there? Yeah, okay. Right, so, mm-hmm. Scott Rail Free Wi-Fi. Uh, naturally, you end up with things like O2 Wi-Fi. Now, at the minute this is pretty dumb, this kind of assumes that there's only one base station with any given name. Well, duh, no, there are millions with the name uh, O2 Wi-Fi, so there's something I need to fix uh, pretty soon. But can you imagine, and I'm looking for an example here, but I may need you to use your Im imagination. So this person here, let us hypothesize for a moment that they are in fact a student, because they're connected to EduRome, maybe a member of staff, who knows. And they also connect to that Sky Wi-Fi, that Sky Wi-Fi, and that's another one there. If I had found another blue node up here, which, yeah, probably connected to EduRome as well, but actually also connected to those two, would it be a reasonable assumption that that imaginary blue node there actually knew that person there? Because obviously they've shared their Wi-Fi base stations at some time. Aha. Right, we've just entered a whole magic new world. We're not just talking about, right, can I say somebody's been somewhere in the past? Just by gathering this stuff, I should now be able to say, who knows who? Ooh, that's interesting. Can I start working out associations just by listening to these things? Let's get imaginative. Let's imagine that these two hypothetical people are on Facebook or LinkedIn or wherever. If they know each other, are they likely to be linked on Facebook or not? They're probably likely to be linked. So, if I scraped Facebook and all of the links between people on Facebook, and I collected a humongous amount of this data and started matching the connections between them, could I start telling who's who? Is there a kind of, um, now what's the word I'm after, morphic shape thing to do here, uh, an isomorphism between the graph of connections like that and the social network graph? Oh, right. That would be fun. Now, I'm not, th I'm not there yet, okay? But, I'd, you know, I think that could be done. I think that would be a really fun little project to try. Um, what can I see around here? Uh, okay, whoever that is has been on holiday to Costa Adeje Gran, wherever that is. Uh, any good ones? There was a good one up here. Oh, and occasionally I do this, I accidentally click on something and it relays out the whole graph and I've now no idea where any of these things are because that's, uh, that's automatic. Um, but as long as you get the idea that simply by collecting this kind of information and possibly correlating it with other sources, uh, we can start deducing things about owners of phones, about identifying people. Uh, oh, I know who that is. <laughs> yeah, okay, right. So that's the database back end for the thing. Neo4j is lovely for this. Why? Because it kind of works in nodes and circles and links between them anyway, which is exactly what we want for this type of analysis. I can write queries saying, you know, given that starting point, can you give me the set of people who might have been connected to that, and you, know, you, can, you can set your queries up. But also, um, an incredibly scalable technology. Uh, I'm running Neo4j on here at the minute. It wouldn't take me very much to actually have it sitting up on the Amazon cloud somewhere and have it scalable really to the nth degree very, very easily. So that's, that's probably one of the next stages I'll do, is actually try and worry about how we do really large scale data gathering. Right nearly there. Okay, so that's the graph of associations. 
the one you've just seen is pretty dumb. It's got base stations and it's got mobile devices on there. Uh, where I want to go is actually start thinking about actually what do I really want in my graph model? Well, I certainly want the base stations and the BSSIDs, which are green and blue. Uh, I want mobile devices, I want people, I want places, I want timestamps. I want to be able to say there are multiple people may have the same name. I want to be able to say there are multiple BS, multiple base stations owned by the same company. All of this kind of good, but that's just, that's just computer science. In fact, it's not even that. It's database design, schema design. We can do that. That's relatively straightforward. Um, the relationships. What kind of relationships do we think we should be able to do with this? Well, associated, yeah, the base station associated with the device. Owns, carries, uses. Can I tell which set of devices belong to which person? Can I start telling what kind of devices these are? Well, if I spot one of these which asks for the same set of BSS IDs every day and walks past me, but with a different MAC address, actually I know they're carrying an Apple device because they're the ones that are doing the, the Mac spoofing. So yeah, I can start working out what kind of technology they're using. Um, Starting to properly locate places with the uh, the GPS would be fun. What do you want to know? Basically, how far can we push this? What other data can we correlate it with to start working out interesting things? Um, I spoke, you, know, you will know, that as I speak fairly regularly and routinely with Police Scotland, that you know, I spoke to them about this. Oh, tremendously exciting. Uh, you know, civil liberties... Uh, at that point, I start thinking about the ethical ramifications of the existence of this kind of technique. But there's, you know, there's 101 things we could start telling about people by doing some data mining on this stuff. The next stage, better data mining, uh, better knowledge of the patterns that occur. I'm starting to see some regularity in the uh, in those graphs that we see, and thinking, well, what, actually, what's the significance of that? You can start combining it with info from upper layers of the stack. At the minute, all I'm doing is capturing the one type of packet. What if I actually started capturing some of this stuff? The phone with that MAC address was seen connecting to an IP address which is associated with the dark web, with whatever. Then, yet, there's a whole load more information that I could grab and start doing interesting things with this. How much of this do I actually need to start doing real data mining? Don't know. Open question. Uh, Three dollars a pop. I can even, you know, this this isn't university funded. These came out of my own pocket. Three dollars. I don't mind. Um, okay. Future work. Better model of actors and the entities and the relationship and the correlation. The phone home is actually a bit brain dead. It needs fixing. Uh, certainly more sophisticated data mining. And I guess that really is the highest priority now. We've got some real data to work with. Can we start digging through the thing? Early conclusions to this project. Well. Given large enough volumes of data, it will actually let you start identifying tracking devices and doing interesting things in terms of telling what people are up to. Real outcome in terms of privacy and tying it right the way back to the original title of the, the talk. Why do we need ProBrec? Why does your phone constantly need to be shouting, Hey, Starbucks, are you there? Can we not just wait five minutes for Starbucks to say, I'm here? and save ourselves a whole load of data leakage. Um, nobody's given me a straight answer to that one yet, so thoughts on that. Uh, you may applaud now. <laughs> no, I'm, I, I'm not chairing this, but guys, do we have time for questions from the floor? Does, does that, yeah. Okay, anybody? Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. As well as yeah. in regards to the... But, but the thing is, that even if they're spoofing, you can still do it and say, well, it's a Mac device, because you know that only they do that. That will change. You know, next week, Android will do it as well, and that's that out the window, but... Yeah. Any more for any more? Rory? So I heard why ProBrain exists. Um, my understanding was that because um, in the early days of wireless, these people said we should have hidden networks, so the networks yeah. broadcast. Yeah, that's right. That's right. 
Yeah, but we're, we, you know, we're so many years beyond that now. Why the hell is it still enabled? It mystifies me. Uh, there's actually a secondary reason. Uh, it's for multi-hand APs. So if you've got multiple APs and you're moving from one to another, you need to be able to see the new one to broadcast across to it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. That's and the only other reason that it's like this. Indeed, but you know, hit, uh, I, I th one of the things I want to be able to do is to actually do some serious data mining on this and say, look, I can work this out from just stuff that your phone is spewing out. Uh, and if I can do that, then I think I can make a reasonable case that actually somebody really ought to look at this as a significant privacy leak there. Any more for any more? Yes, sir. Uh, it's got the backswing on the Apple devices. Doesn't that mean you're not really going to be able to get a lot of information from that? You're not going to be able to link that to get from um, Well, I, I, I think you are, because what you can actually do is use the set of BSSIDs that it asks for. So it, it's actually characteristic. I wish I had the graph there. You know, you've got one... I need a whiteboard or some, or some, some imagination. If you've got... Let me get this right. If you had a set of five of the, the blue circles, the base stations, and you had a green circle, a mobile device on one side, and a green circle, the mobile device on the other side, and that connected to that, that connected to that, that connected to that, that connected to that. So in other words, that one and that one connect to exactly the same set of base stations. Well, either they're two closely related devices or they're one and the same device. And, you know, I think you can actually get around the spoofing, something like that. Not proved, not claiming it as definite, there's mileage in looking at it. Tea break? Mm. Tea break? Next talk. Next talk. In that case, you knew I couldn't do it in 20 minutes, didn't you? <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>